Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. I'm Frank Rausen Pereira. The annual exercise of presenting the budget has been completed. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman did that in the Lok Sabha at 11 a.m. And it was a historic budget in many ways. And to talk about the budget itself, I have with me on the program two very special guests. Mr. Tarun Bajaj, who is the Secretary of Economic Affairs, and uh, Debashish Panda, Secretary of Financial Services. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on the program. Mr. Bajaj, I'd like to start the program with you first. You know, let's first talk about some of the key highlights that you would like to pinpoint and talk about and say that, you know, these were the three biggest takeaways from the budget. So one of the very important things of this budget is that it is followed, it is following the COVID that has hit us. So the health was definitely one of the important features of this budget. And we have actually increased our spend on health uh, substantially. It's gone up from about 94,000 to 2,34,000. That's a big jump. And I think that shows the focus of the government on the health issues. Along with that, I would also say that the other is that while we have a fiscal deficit of 9.5% this year and 6.8% in the next year, we have actually moved to infrastructure spend capital expenditure. So that is another uh, important feature of this budget. The third, I would say, is disinvestment. Uh, we have come up with a very clear, focused policy on disinvestment and have also shown the path ahead. We have already announced two banks and one insurance company that will go for disinvestment. And also it will be followed by many others that will come through the policy. The third thing which is very important, which I would like to emphasize to you and through you to your viewers, is the monetization policy that is going to come up. We are going to put a lot of assets that are going to be monetized. So they would include railways, roads, sports stadia, and many others that will come up. So all in all, I would say that we have created a budget which is a growth-oriented budget, which has also taken care of the poorer sections uh, of the society. And the last but not the least, the budget is a very transparent budget. We have not overestimated. If anything, we have underestimated our uh, revenue figures. And we have also come up openly and upfront on the fiscal deficit and the way we would go ahead with the borrowing. And one very important feature is that we have kept everything into the budget unlike previous years where we had extra budgetary resources and even the extra budgetary resources that are continuing from the previous times, we have brought it openly in the budget state. So, uh, uh, Mr. Panda, let me take this aspect of uh, the fiscal de deficit for, uh, forward with you. 9.5% for this fiscal, 6.8% uh, for the next. So, you know, is that a problem area? Because several economists, several analysts believe that, you know, from 3.5 to 9.5 is a huge jump. I think my colleague will be let, let, in a, yeah, let in me a take position to Mr. answer. Bajaj, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to you on that. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Bajaj. Frank, this is a very interesting question. Till yesterday, I was being asked by the same economist that why are you not spending mm. more? Why are you worried about the fiscal deficit? So, this fiscal deficit, let me explain to you what the policy was. So, basically, our revenues were very stressed because of COVID. We went for a very strict lockdown and because of that, both the direct taxes and indirect taxes were affected. At the same time, it needed a lot of expenditure both on health and also on trying to support the vulnerable sections of the society. So we did both and that is one of the reasons that the fiscal deficit is larger than what some people had imagined. Having said that, I would also say that during these difficult times, we have also expanded our expenditure on capital. So capital was supposed to be 4 lakh 12,000. We have we are likely to end the year at 4 lakh 39,000 and next year we have kept this figure at 6.8 percent. Basically we have taken care of all the expenditure that should happen in this year. We have also taken our revenues at realistic figure, taken the fiscal deficit to 6.8 percent and have also given a roadmap to uh, the people that we will come back to the same consolidation path and we will be below 4.5% in 25-26. So I think this should give the confidence that we are transparent, upfront on our figures. We are not trying to hide anything and we are trying to spend money and spend it properly, usefully. So for the time being, it's all about creating demand so that we can see the V-shaped recovery take the proper V-shape. 
All right, Mr. Panda, let's talk about uh, the disinvestment figures now. You know, do you believe that it can be achieved? Because in the past, we've seen that we, we found it difficult to achieve the targets. You know, we saw what happened with Air India as well. So at some point in time, do you believe that this is an achievable, achievable target? You see, as far as the financial services sector are concerned, there are already two in the pipeline, the disinvestment of IDBI and the LIC uh, IPO for, uh, will be uh, done soon. So the legislative amendments that are required to take it forward is getting cleared in the finance bill. So I think we are very much on track and we hope by, that by within this financial year, uh, we will be, I mean the, the next financial year, we will be able to uh, you know, uh, go for the uh, disinvestment of uh, both these uh, financial institutions. Now two more uh, banks uh, uh, will be privatized and one insurance company also has, is what has been announced uh, by, by, the, by Madam Finance Minister. So work is also in progress on that. There is a new policy which has come out stating how uh, the, the selections would be done. So we'll uh, quickly you know, go through those layers of uh, filtering and come out with the specific uh, banks. And the, parallelly, we will be also working on the legislative amendments that will be required. So as far as the financial sector is concerned, we hope uh, that we'll be able to meet the targets uh, that have been projected. If you allow me yeah, to come in do, here, please do, please do, uh, your specific question was whether we'll be able to achieve the figures or not. So let me say that last year the figures were 2 lakh and 10,000. We have brought it down to 1 lakh 75,000 crores this year. But there are a large number of companies that are already in the process of strategic disinvestment. Concor is there, BPCL is there, BML is there, Pavan Hans is there, Air India is there. Uh, so these companies, the transactions are likely to be completed this year. And actually I was asked by another channel that if you complete all these transactions, we feel that you'll be able to achieve more than 1,75,000 crores. So my hope is that we'll be able to get more than 1,75,000 crores and not just 1,75,000. So, you know, you, you spoke about infrastructure and there's a massive push really as far as the uh, on the infrastructure front. Uh, you know, is that something that is planned? You know, do you believe that the job creation that we are talking about, you know, job losses was one of the big reasons or one of the big issues really over the last 10 months. Can that be addressed? I think definitely the money that we are spending on infrastructure is about 2.5% of the GDP and ha uh, it has a 25 uh, multiplier with it so we feel that this is actually going to have a good multiplier effect and also have an effect on jobs so the job scene would also improve and I would also like uh, you to recollect that during the Atmanirbhar package a particular scheme on job creation was create uh, was announced where if people are taken back on the job or new employees are taken on job the government will pay their EPFO contributions for the next two years. So I think with infrastructure spend, with the kind of reforms that we are un uh, undertaking, and with all these measures that we are undertaking, there would definitely be an improvement in the employment opportunities and we see a positive there. In fact, just to add to that, yeah, infra, please do. We, yeah. as you are aware, we are, uh, Madam has already announced that we will be establishing a development financial institute. Yeah, I was just going to come to that, you know, and, and take that up with you. So, yeah, I just underline that, in fact, yes, while, yes. while... Yes, so while that is coming, going yeah. to, you know, uh, take things forward as far as infra financing is concerned. Currently, you know, you have some NBFCs uh, who are uh, in, in, uh, in operation in financing infrastructure. But here, what you need is patient capital, where they can then long term for 25 years, 30 years. Typically, banks are not suitable because of the asset liability mismatch that they are suited to lend for five years or so. So, uh, this was something we have been working on to establish this uh, DFI. And it's almost the nuts and bolts are being tightened now. And I think we'll be very soon getting this uh, approval of the cabinet and uh, introduce the bill in the parliament during the ongoing session. So, broadly, what is this uh, DFI? Yeah. DFI will have three major roles. It will have a developmental role, most importantly. And uh, secondly, it will have a financing role. And thirdly, it will do a lot of project monitoring. So maybe they'll create a vertical inside uh, the organization to, pro uh, to monitor projects real time using technology. Only then you will be able to sort of take infrastructure forward, uh, infrastructure financing, uh, as far as the debt side is concerned. So uh, this institution will be backed by a legislation 
and uh, it will also access uh, funds which will be provided i mean at a cheaper cost so that uh, you know then they are able to lend and uh, uh, to 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 various infrastructure projects so there will be some support from the government and uh, uh, then it will be sort of uh, this uh, dfi uh, will also be a market maker and uh, it will also uh, deepen the uh, bond market because the dfi alone cannot uh, you know uh, fund the entire of this uh, 100 crore infrastructure pipeline and this uh, legislation is already going to provide for establishment of private dfis as well so it is a very comprehensive legislation and i'm sure uh, this is going to help uh, infra financing in a big way in the coming times and since we are here we must talk about the bad bank as well you know it's been spoken about for a few months a couple of years in fact and quite some time now and finally we have it in motion what shape do you see it taking many analysts and economists have been calling for you know segregating the bad from the good and you know how we should take it forward that way so your thoughts on that so actually a bad bank is not a bank but it is basically a warehouse where it uh, aggregates all the bad assets or the stressed assets. So this proposal was uh, there uh, on the table uh, which was actually initiated by the IBA and uh, the IBA generally have the membership of the public sector as well as private banks. Now for large uh, projects you know more than 500 crores uh, the existing ARCs the asset reconstruction company they don't have the capacity because they are very thinly capitalized. And secondly, these assets are also quite complex to resolve. So the proposal of uh, the IBA was to create a ARC AMC structure. And initially they wanted the government also to be uh, holding some equity. But we looked at the pros and cons and it was felt uh, appropriate that let the bankers promote this. Government may provide some support if required so as to take their initiative forward. So the, the most of these projects initially were planning around 70 odd assets to be transferred to this ARC AMC worth about uh, more than 2 lakh crores. Now 80 to 90 percent have already been provisioned. So the balance sheet that way has been cleaned up but the money is locked here. So how do the banks realize maximum value out of these assets and if these assets are not resolved in time then there will be erosion of value and the banks will lose. So it was felt necessary that that uh, if you have an ARC AMC structure then the consolidation of these assets happen. If there are 10-12 banks then all of them agree to transfer it is transferred on a specific date to this ARC. Thereafter they transfer it to the AMC. They will go for the resolution of that asset. They will also preserve the value, enhance the value and uh, as and when they get an appropriate uh, investor, a potential investor or sell it to the AIF and pay back the money to the banks. So, so this is how start for the banks really going yeah, forward. Yeah, I mean it takes care of the legacy NPAs and God forbid if there are uh, some spike in the COVID NPAs also can be taken care of through this mechanism. So uh, the proposal is uh, there and we are already engaged with the regulator. So we hope to take this initiative forward very soon. Absolutely. It's a good initiative and I'm sure that it will see great results. So very quick, uh, Mr. Pajaj, a couple of last questions maybe before I let you go. A busy day for you, a tight schedule that you need to keep. So you know the economic survey spoke about uh, uh, growth of about 11 percent. The IMF speaks about 11.5 percent. You know, do you see us achieving that target? What are the sectors that we need to watch out for? So the IMF, which is a body on which we don't have any control, says 11.5 percent. The chief economic advisor is also an independent kind of an authority in the Ministry of Finance, he says 11 percent. And let me say that the budget that we have prepared, we have calculated 14.4 nominal growth. So we have actually kept our real growth lower than 11 percent also. So I think the sectors that we should see as growing would be the services sector, the industry sector would also grow. And as you have seen, the agriculture sector, even in these COVID times, is giving us that hope it is actually growing at 3.4 percent. So I think we should see a growth in all these sectors in the coming months also because of the low base effect and uh, I'm sure uh, having been conservative in my estimates on growth I should actually be exceeding this uh, growth. Since you brought up services I must ask you a follow-up question on that. 
the services sector feels a little hard done by they feel they have not gotten you know they are due over the last 10 months or so especially hospitality has been hit badly you know tourism uh, the airlines so is do you see any kind of recovery there yes we definitely see recovery there one we have provided some relief there was a scheme of the ECLGS where the money was provided to these companies if they so wanted so that is one area the second is the COVID vaccine is going to help a lot. Now, once the COVID vaccine comes and you have seen the number of active cases going down, I think once you are able to have a complete control and people have confidence, I think they will start using the services with a vengeance. You will not, you will have to wait for hours to get into a restaurant. You will have to wait for days to get a uh, plane ticket. And maybe you should book your uh, hotels well in time for tourist places. So we will actually see a lot of growth on that side. So revenge tourism may indeed take place is what you're suggesting. That's the word we picked up during the pandemic as well. Mr. Panda, your final thoughts? I think it's a great budget and a lot of reforms, a lot of spending on infra, new institutions being created. So I think all in all it augurs well for the country, for the economy and the COVID vaccine is also rolling, being rolled out. So I think we are in for good times. Okay. On that happy and good note then, let me thank both you gentlemen for taking time off from your busy schedule and joining me here on Rajya Sabha Television. Thank you so much, Mr. Bajaj and Mr. Panda. Well, we'll slip into a short break now. We'll continue our discussion with two new guests, two new panelists on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.